So we're about to move into our next session, um, which is a careers panel about ways that you can get involved in liberty, whether you be in academia, uh, in policy, um, or interning. So about ways that you can involve yourself in the libertarian movement in a professional capacity. Um, so today we have John Thrasher uh, from Monash University, with Evan Mulholland from the Institute of Public Affairs, and we also have Ava Gundula, who is a um, Mankell scholar. Um, so first off, I'd like to introduce John Thrasher, who's a philosophy lecturer at um, Monash University. So let's give him a round of applause. Okay, uh, thank you. So my talk today is going to be on how you can um, get a career in academia and how you can advance liberty in academia and the challenges of doing that and also why I want you to do it, perhaps, if you're interested, and also um, why you should want to do it as well. So I'll start with the first part. Um, some of you may have noticed there's a specter haunting us, a specter of nationalism and authoritarianism and illiberal ideologies uh, throughout the world, even in my own home of the United States. And even here in our Antipodean wonderland, these ideas have come about, and liberty seems under threat everywhere. So why would academia be a possible solution to that problem? Well, I'm going to talk a little bit about why um, some people have thought that academics are important for positive social change and why they may pay, play an actual, a crucial role in that. So I'm going to talk about that first. So why academia? Well, maybe three reasons why I think academia uh, can be valuable for you and for the world uh, if you're a liberty-leaning person. One is that the academics can control the, uh, the intellectual commanding heights, which I'll explain what that means in a second, but that's an important aspect of this. Also, uh, academics are, are crucial for training the next generation of whatever it happens to be, other academics, but also professionals, journalists, whoever you might be, insofar as you go to a university, or even if you don't go to a university, academics are typically going to train the teachers that are going to train um, you know, the secondary school uh, students as well. And there's just a general uh, advantage or a good thing about kind of the curi curiosity and the quest for truth that you might be interested in um, if you want to be an academic. Okay, so we'll talk about the first one first. Uh, so the intellectual commanding heights. Well, what do I mean by this? Well, this is a term that supposedly uh, Lenin used with regards to production, where he talks about how the socialists needed to seize the economic commanding heights. And what he meant by that was the heavy industry of the society. But the analogy is meant to kind of... Uh, go to, to warfare primarily, which in, in warfare you want to have the high ground so that you can fire down upon the people below you even more easily. Now, of course, we don't want to fire down upon other people, but the idea is that there are some, there are some kind of um, ideas um, that are more important than others. What do I mean by that? Not just that are better than others, but that many ideas that we don't think necessarily have roots in kind of other intellectual uh, notions or concepts often can be deeply rooted in them without us knowing it. And so that's the important point, is that we need to develop those ideas that are then going to influence and kind of move down through the stratum of other kind of lower level ideas. And so I'll talk about that process in a second. So one example of this, a uh, kind of famous example, was uh, put forward in the, in the general theory by Keynes. So he has this great line in there where he says, the idea of economists and political philosophers, both when they're right and when they're wrong, are more powerful than is commonly understood. Indeed, the world is ruled by little else. Practical men who believe themselves to be quite exempt from any intellectual influence are usually the slaves of some defunct economist. And so this is the, the very idea of the, command, the intellectual commanding heights that I'm trying to get at. Practical people um, who are just working in industry, voters, journalists, whomever, they think they're coming to these ideas because they're just looking at the world and they're getting them directly from, you know, from something or from, you know, this is just what reasonable people think. Well, indeed, they've been kind of coached through these ideas through many generations of other thinkers who have kind of infiltrated through their teachers and their teachers' teachers and the general kind of societal framework. And they're, they're, they've been living in that environment for so long that they see that as being natural. But in fact, they are ideas from philosophers and economists from many generations ago, typically. That's what Keynes is arguing. Now, his great, um, his great uh, kind of antagonist, Hayek, had a similar theory. Uh, and so he had a great uh, essay called Intellectuals and Socialism, where he develops this at length, and this is from that. Um, and he wants to talk about why he thinks kind of the development of ideas 
is the most important part of building a free society. Now, so some of you might think part of the goal of my talk here is to suggest that working on ideas can be as important or more important than the practical work of politics or of industry. We need all of these things, of course, but Hayek wanted to argue that the most important thing was working on ideas. Why? Because he thought that what the socialists had that liberals didn't have was an idea of a liberal utopia. That is, a vision of a society, of a good society, a liberal society, that people could be inspired by and want to work towards. Okay? He thought the socialists had this, and this is why they'd won in the 19th century and the early 20th century. And he thought the only way to defeat them and to defeat statism and authoritarianism in general was to create a truly radical liberalism that had a kind of liberal utopia as a vision of a good society that people could work towards. And he thought the only people who could develop those ideals were people like him, naturally, but also um, other thinkers, so political scientists, theorists, um, economists, perhaps. OK, so what was Hayek's model of social change? Um, well, it's not showing up totally here, but at the very top level is what he, he calls academics or philosophers, and that includes philosophers, economists, jurists. You can think of this as a kind of production model. So at the top is the highest level of production. So, and then as you get further and further down, you get more and more refined goods. Okay? So at the second level is what Hayek called secondhand dealers and ideas. And this is what he described as the intellectuals. So these are people like journalists, like teachers. He talked about the clergy. You could think of them as, as a lot of pundits, even politicians to a certain extent. They're mostly getting their ideas in, in a kind of version of the ideas that are developed at the higher level by the academics. And then finally, at the very lowest level, you have the general public who are consuming ideas. And they're typically getting them from newspapers, magazines, from pundits, uh, maybe from people in, you know, in their school or their church or wherever. But Hayek's argument, he, his argument in intellectuals and socialism is that we need to not forget about these secondhand dealers and ideas. What I'm trying to argue is that we also need to concentrate on the academics. And that's what I'm, I, I think, hopefully, you can see the importance of that as well. OK, so that's the intellectual commanding heights. The other issue is that um, we need to train the next generation. So even if we have, so imagine every generation, Hayek says this, and I think this is true, every generation we have to kind of relearn the ideas of liberty over and over again. Why? Because there's another generation that's coming about that doesn't know them yet, or that they don't know them sufficiently. So we have to kind of re-argue these cases. So Hayek, in many ways, is re-arguing the case of John Stuart Mill and Adam Smith. Right? Mill is arguing the case that Smith was making the generation before. And we have people that have to do this over and over again. So even if for some reason we lived in a liberal utopia where we got things right, we would still need to be training the next generation to understand these ideas and to be able to articulate them. So that's a very important role that teachers in general have to play, but especially academic at the highest level, because they're the ones who are going to train the teachers, train the journalists, et cetera. Okay, so that's another reason why being an academic could be important. Um, another reason, the third reason, is a kind of intrinsic reason, which is just that some of you who may be interested, let me just take a poll. Is anyone interested in becoming an academic, or am I just talking to myself here? Okay, a couple people. Okay, so if you are interested in becoming an academic, then you probably have some um, intrinsic, you find some intrinsic value for searching for wisdom or truth or, or knowledge or whatever it may be. And there's, there's great joy in that, and it's a very enjoyable process. So there's kind of an intrinsic benefit. Even if you couldn't, even if you didn't succeed in all the other things that you were trying to do, there would be value in that as well. So the quest for truth is important. And the joy of investigation is both valuable um, in its own right, and it can be important down the line. So it might be that there's things that you can help discover now that for generations, no one will be able, they, they, won't, they won't have any effect. But some later point, someone will come back and find this thing that you've written or that you've thought about, and it might be valuable in the future. So even if you're, you know, even if we're moving into a new dark ages, there might be hope in the future that someone could find the work that you've done, and it can help uh, in, in a future time. OK. So let's imagine that you want to become an academic. Well, how do you go about doing that? Well, it's a pretty straightforward process in Australia. Okay, so you basically, um, you have to do your undergraduate degree, and then you have to do an honors degree, for the most part. And you have to get a top mark in the honors degree. And then you're probably going to want to go do an MA, um, depending on the, the degree that you're trying to seek before you get a PhD. And then only then can you get an academic position. So there's a long process that you're going to have to go through. And at every stage, people are going to be weeded out. Okay? They're going to be weeded out in terms of quality. 
in terms of interest. So some people just aren't good enough to hack it at the next stage. Some people don't have the interest in wanting to hack it at the next stage, right? They get tired of it. They want to do something else, right? They're, they, they, um, they see the opportunity cost is higher and higher. And then there's another aspect too, which is that um, you know, you have to be, to become an academic, you have to be chosen by your colleagues, by the colleagues that exist with you in your PhD program. You have to have advisors who are willing to support you. And then to get a job in the academic community, you're going to, have to be hired by people who will be your future colleagues, which means you have to be appealing to them in various ways. Now, that can be done on the one hand in terms of your research being very good, but it's also true that sometimes um, if you have heterodox opinions of various sorts, this can make it more difficult sometimes. Okay. So that's the challenge that's going to have to go through here. Now, what I would say to those of you in the room that are Australians or Kiwis is that you should do your honors work and perhaps an MA here in the Antipodes. But if you're going to do a PhD, you should go to the United States um, for a variety of reasons. One, because we have the best educational system in the United States but also because the training there is different than it is here. It's longer, it involves more coursework for the most part. This has a lot of advantages. First of all, you're gonna be competing against Americans on the job market. So I'm an American, I work at an Australian university. That's true across the board. It's a world market in academia. There's no protectionism for academics for the most part, okay? So you have to compete on a free market with everyone. Given that the United States usually has the best universities, um, there's some British universities that are very good as well, but most, even there, they don't usually compete on the mar job market with the American universities. That's probably where you should aim to go. So that can be a big challenge um, for a lot of people because it means you're gonna have to leave home, you're gonna have to spend a lot of time overseas, there could be other issues as well. But that's what I would recommend if you wanna do that and that's gonna put you in a much better position um, to get an academic position uh, later on. So I'm happy to talk to all of you. I'm gonna be all, all weekend, so if you wanna talk more about the details of this, I've thought about this a lot. Some of you may be familiar with the Institute for Humane Studies in the United States. I used to work with them on their educational um, and research and academic teams trying to help people get jobs in academia. So I would like to talk to you all individually um, about the details of your own interest and we can talk more about that, but that's the general story. Okay, so as an academic, how can you spread liberty? How can you spread knowledge? Well, one way you can do it, and the most obvious way, is by teaching. So you can see this, this gentleman over here. You've seen him previously. You can't maybe tell as well from the uh, picture, but that's Mike Munger teaching at his home university at Duke University. He's taught many, many students over the years, and many of them have come in contact with him. He's also done that here today for us. He's given us a little talk, and so we've learned directly from him. So that's one way to do it, and that's the most common way of thinking about the influence that we can have. But... There's also other ways. So you may recognize this, Mike Munger in a different guise, this time dressed as a policeman. Um, this is from a video that he did with Russ Roberts. Uh, I think it was Fear the Boom and Bust. It was the kind of rap video between Hayek and Keynes. Mike Munger's been on that. He's been on Akon Talk. So he's done all these kind of things that aren't within the traditional academic kind of realm. And he's, he's, he's reach, he, he can reach a lot of people by doing that. So as an academic, if you reach a certain level, uh, the level of, say, Mike Munger, then you can kind of you can communicate along different lines. And the most famous version of this, and the most, I think, effective version of this, which is the namesake for this conference, which was Milton Friedman. I mean, some of you maybe have been too young to see Free to Choose, but it's an amazing, amazing version of this, where he's really communicating at a high level. Um, but to do this kind of thing, you have to be at the top of your game academically. Milton Friedman was, you know, one of the top economists in the world, um, and and Mike Munger is, you know, a t top political scientist. So to do that, to have that kind of reach, you're going to have to be um, very high level academically. It's not just teaching. It's not just uh, the other work, though. Sometimes people think that academic research doesn't have an effect because not many people uh, read it in the general public. That might be true, but when you think about how many people could potentially read your work over, over many, many years, right, it's much higher than the amount of people that you could reach directly by teaching them, right? So to use an extreme case, think of someone like Thomas Hobbes or Spinoza. He probably only, they probably only taught, in Thomas Hobbes' case, didn't teach really anyone. Neither in Spinoza, they weren't directly interacting with him, but we're reading them centuries later, right? So there's just thousands and thousands and thousands and millions of people that they're reaching. Now, similarly, you could write a book like Michael Munger, and people could read his book uh, over the years. Many of us have read these books, uh, or Robert Nozick, Robert Nozick's dead. We continue to read his books, though. He can't teach us anymore directly, but we can continue to read his books. And Milton Friedman, we can still read his books. And people like this. So as Mike Munger likes to say sometimes, 
Uh, writing can be a, a form of teaching, and it's sometimes the best and most efficient way of teaching. So don't get trapped into thinking that your, uh, that your research is going to be read by a small group of people. It will, but that's a multiplied much larger than the people that you're probably going to be able to, to interact with directly in your life. Okay. So hopefully I've just laid out some, some advantages uh, to academia, why I think it's valuable to pursue. There are some, I'll just leave with this, there are some costs to doing this. So someone before the panel said, well, you have to spend a decade in the university, that kind of thing, before you can become an academic. That's true. You do have to do that. But if you enjoy the work that you're doing, it's not all a cost. Um, and then once, you, once you're able to pursue the kind of research and teaching that you want to do, it's very pleasurable on a day-to-day -day basis. You get to work on things that you, you find important and valuable if you're doing it right. And that's, that's, that's a good value. It's hard to think of a better job in that respect. And I'll just end here with Hayek. Um, at the very end of that essay um, on intellectuals and socialism, he says this. And this is his kind of send off to say what we need to do as liberals to kind of make the world a better place. He can say, we can make the philosophic foundations of a free society once more a living intellectual issue. And it's implementation a task which challenges the ingenuity and imagination of our liveliest minds. If we can regain that belief in the power of ideas, which was the mark of liberalism at its best, the battle is not lost. And the key point here is, is the very end part, where, where Hayek says, we can regain the belief in the power of ideas, which was the mark of liberalism. Liberalism is fundamentally about the power of ideas and the power of reason and the power of communication and free thought to, to, to get better rather than worse ideas and to lead to progress. Okay? So if you're concerned about that, and if you think that's a valuable project, hopefully you will help you will join us in academia. So thanks.